Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. The first of my two short sessions this afternoon is on blind bronchoalveolar lavage. This is my conflict of interest disclosure. None of these are pertinent to the talks I'm giving this afternoon. When we're thinking about indications for airway sampling, there's lots of occasions in which it's really important for us to try and establish a cytological diagnosis. Or perhaps we need to capture samples that we can use for culture. When we're thinking about our options for airway disease, if we have a patient who's clearly based, based on radiographs or other imaging got a very focal lesion, then we're more likely to have to do a directed bronchoscopic approach. But if we has a, have a patient who has relatively diffuse low airway disease, then a blind BAL is often a really useful way of trying to get some diagnostic information. So I would consider this an option for patients who have a tentative diagnosis of asthmatic or allergic airway disease, potentially patients who have suggestions of a, a fungal infection, a pulmonary fungal infection, or potentially something parasitic. So I work in Texas where fungal disease is relatively endemic, and so if somebody showed me these radiographs and said it's a two-year-old cat, I would say this is probably histoplasmosis. If they said it was a 20-year-old cat, I would say, well, it could be cancer or it could still be histoplasmosis. And this is a patient where establishing a diagnosis in a timely fashion is really, really important. And, and if the patient's able to withstand it, this is an ideal case for a blind BAL. There's a tremendous amount of material in that chest. It's going to be relatively easy for us to retrieve that. And this is the kind of findings we might get if this patient does, in fact, have pulmonary histoplasmosis. You can see the pulmonary macrophages, and you can see billions of little organisms sitting happily within them. When I'm trying to decide what airway diagnostics are going to be prudent, if I'm reaching for a blind BAL, I've got to kind of think about the logistics of the process. And it is very, very fast. If you've got a team who are used to doing it, the patient is under anesthesia for less than five minutes. So I have an anesthesia team at the vet school who are always determined to put an art line on everybody. And I just say, I will be done before you shave the leg for the art line. And so really minimal instrumentation, enough to prove that they're alive, and then speed really is the essence. I'm also aware, though, with any patient with respiratory disease, you can acutely decompensate them. So we can take a patient who is doing okay, and then they can get worse after airway diagnostics. So we have to have a plan in, in place, and we have to have talked to the client about the possibility of making things worse. So this is not something to do at 4.55 on a Friday if you close at 5 o'clock. This is a first thing in the morning, hopefully home today, with a plan for oxygen to sp support if the patient does take a, a step backwards. We do need to use IV anesthesia to do this, so you've got to have intravenous access. And then the smallest patient we can do it on is a patient who can accommodate a three millimeter endotracheal tube. And most of our cats, we can easily get a four millimeter tube in. And dogs, obviously, this is really, really easy. When I'm doing the procedure, I do pre-oxygenate for five minutes. So before we induce anesthesia, we pre-oxygenate. And that's because we're not going to be able to ventilate for the patient. We routinely use propofol as our induction agent, which is going to trigger some degree of apnea. But if we just hold a face mask over that patient for five minutes, we actually load that alveoli with oxygen. So if they don't bother actually successfully ventilating for a few minutes, they've still got all that oxygen that can just diffuse right across that alveoli and maintain a really good blood saturation. So hugely important to pre-oxygenate. Depending on what my suspicions are for their underlying disease, I may also use a bronchodilator. So if it's a cat, sometimes we'll do a few puffs of albuterol. If it's, if it's a dog, I'm more likely to use terbutaline. But if I'm suspicious of something bronchoconstrictive, that could be made worse, and that's a very, very safe and prudent thing to do. As far as equipment, it's actually a wonderful trick because nothing we're going to use is tremendously expensive. You had to order a few supplies, but nothing is costly. So we do need a sterile endotracheal tube, size appropriate to the patient some sterile lubes, some sterile scissors. And then the key part of this process is this device called an Argyle Salem Sump Dual Lumen Stomach Tube. They're used in people, I guess it goes, I think maybe down the nose, I can't think about where it goes in people, but it's used to decompress the stomach. Um, they're relatively inexpensive. They come in two sizes, a six French, which is my go-to for a cat, and an eight French for dogs, about 24 inches long, and they only cost about $10 each. We only use them once and throw them away. They really are designed for a single use only. So this is a, an image of the device. So this is the actual sump part that's going to go down the airway. Then at the end of it, there are two different lines. One is a device that you're going to attach to your mucus trap, and then that is attached to suction. And then we have an inflow tube through which we're going to put our saline. So we're able to get our saline in, and then the suction is ready to go. And that's why it makes this such a successful and easy way of trying to get a good airway sample. <clears throat> 
Because um, they're actually designed to accommodate a catheter tip syringe, and we're using much smaller volumes of saline, we do use our sterile scissors just to cut the end off of the blue saline inflow and make sure that that fits perfectly onto the syringes that we're going to be using for our saline infusion. This is our mucus specimen trap device, and these are about $5 each. Um, and they come in a little kit. There's also a, st a sterile separate lid you can use to seal the sample when you're done. Basically, a small plastic tube, a special lid, two tubes coming out the top. One attaches to your suction device, and the other tube attaches to the sump going into the patient. We also do need some kind of suction. So wall-mounted suction is fine, or a portable suction is fine. The suction system itself does not need to be sterile. That sterile trap is going to capture all of your return, so you can use an unsterile suction tube. When I'm doing a bronchoalveolar lavage, my rule of thumb is to use one mil per kilo of, of warm saline. And it does make a difference for the saline to be warm. It seems to be less irritating to the airway. I max it out at 20 cc. So if it's a great day and it's still gonna get 20 cc's of saline, but if it's less than 20 kilos, I just, I just ratchet it down. So one mil per kilo. And I usually set up three aliquots. We don't always need to use three aliquots, but it's hard in the mechanics of it to suddenly say, I need more saline. So I just prep with three doses so that I am ready to go. And that saline should just be in lure, t lure slip syringes. They're going to mate effectively with that blue saline inflow tube. So we induce with propofol. We're going to numb the remoglottis in a cat. And then we intubate with a sterile endotracheal tube. And that's reassuring because you've got the airway secured. If something's not going well, you are all set to be able to provide oxygen and ventilate for the patient. You don't want to put that sterile endotracheal tube too far down. So do pre-measure so that you're not going beyond about the mid-cervical area. You do not want that endotracheal tube to go way down into the thoracic, um, the thoracic portion of the trachea. And then secure that to the upper jaw. And then getting ready to do things, we attach our mucus trap to our suction tubing. So that is good to go. And then we clamp off our suction tubing until we need it, often with just a hemostat, or we have a student just crimp that tube so that the suction is ready to go, but the suction is being prevented from actually working. We attach our mucus trap to the sump device, and then we kind of figure out how much of the sump device should go into the patient. So I'll kind of hold it out with my sterile gloves on and think, okay, I need to be about this far in. And they have markings on so you can get a sense of how far you need to go. And the goal is to drive that sump device into an airway until it is just wedged. So you just gently insert it until you hit resistance. If you've got a small patient, you can actually catch yourself, though, on the end of the endotracheal tube. And you get a sense that you're, you're stuck on something, but clearly you're not far enough in. So I do pre-measure so I know I'm not distracting myself by being caught on the end of the endotracheal tube. So this is a photograph here. We just did this last week, right before I came away. It was really good timing. So we've got our, our sump devices going into our patient. We've got our mucus trap ready, and we've got our suction line. And so we're just going to very gently insert that. We're lucky. We often use a, an elbow device on our um, endotrach tube, which is sterile. And so we can actually still have oxygen flowing through the endotrach tube in a largest animal while we're doing this. If you haven't got access to the elbow, we just um, pre-oxygenate have the endotracheal tube in and go. But the elbow is nice because you still can put some oxygen through them. You then attach your, your syringes of saline to the inflow and you inject. And then you make sure that somebody holds the mucus trap upright because if it flips on one side, it was all for naught. And then you unclamp your suction. We usually have an enthusiastic student coupage the chest. I'm not sure it does much, but maybe it moves a bit more mucus and the students therefore are taking part. Um, and then if we don't get good return, I, I wonder if the end of the sump is maybe stuck against the wall, although it has many perforations. So we just gently move the sump if our return is disappointing. And so this is my technician. She's pinching off the tube. I have got the saline syringe that's attached to the blue inflow. And then this is the sump entering the endotrach tube. So once I've injected my saline, I say to my technician, let go of the suction. So she lets go of the suction. And then we immediately have suction pulling that saline back down from that airway and back into that trap. We usually do it, I mean, I would say half the time we end up doing it the full three times. That saline is absorbed incredibly quickly, and it's harmless. It is impossible, basically, to drown a patient with 0.9% saline. And so if you're not ready to go, if somebody flips over the sump, if, the, if somebody has a, has a glitch and you feel like your aliquot just entered the lung and it disappeared, do not worry. You're absolutely able to go ahead and do it. And I routinely do it three times, not a problem at all. 
Sometimes it just takes one sample, that's all, we, that's all we need. And one of the things we look for to prove that we did in fact get a good deep alveolar lavage is this foam. So this is a classic result of getting surfactant in the sample. And so that foamy look tells us, yes, this is in fact a blind bronchoalveolar lavage. So that surfactant, that foam, tells us this was not just an endotracheal wash. It truly was an alveolar lavage. As soon as we've got a sample that we're satisfied with, we just remove the sump device and then we oxygenate while the patient just recovers. And as soon as they're no longer tolerating the tube, we just go ahead and extubate the patient. As far as what to do with the sample, um, depends a little bit on what your problems were, but generally speaking, if I've gone to the effort of doing a, a blind BAL, I'm going to want both cytology and culture. Remember, for cytology, you really want to put that sample into an EDTA tube unless someone's going to look at that cytology immediately. If you put a sample for cytology into a plain serum tube, those cells will degenerate. And by the time that sample gets to a laboratory, it's really hard for a pathologist to give you good information about what those cells really looked like. So EDTA tube is perfect for a cytology. Sometimes we get a cell count as well. There's kind of guidelines about what the cell count should be for a BAL. So sometimes a proper cell count is useful along with the cytology. And then we have plain samples that we're going to use for culture. And generally speaking, unless I've got major cost concerns, my routine plan for an airway workup is to do um, an aerobic culture. Plus or minus anaerobic, and usually I do plus or minus mycoplasma, and usually I do. Depends a little bit on what my history is, what drugs have been used, what my clinical index of suspicion is for infection. If you're lucky and you work someplace where you can hand the sample off still warm, you haven't got to worry about it. But if those samples need to be shipped, then they need to be preserved appropriately. So um, use a culturette if you're going to be sending samples if plating is going to be delayed. And if you want to get an anaerobic culture on a sample that's being shipped, you've got to put it into an anaerobic culturette. They really can't culture samples effectively for anaerobes that have been exposed to air. As far as risks and contradictions, um, contraindications, not contradictions, um, probably the, the, the risks are actually very, very small. If you were incautious with your sump device, it's relatively soft, it's got a blunt tip, it is designed to be atraumatic, but if you hadn't got some idea about how far to go and you were over-enthusiastic, you potentially could damage the airway if you aggressively inserted the tube. It's very, very easy when you're doing it, though, to get a sense that I have hit gentle resistance, which tells you that the device has lodged itself nicely into an airway. And that's going to let your saline flow forward, lavage, and then be collected safely back. If you're not careful as far as your hygiene, then potentially you could introduce an infection. So do be cognizant about the fact that the airway is basically sterile. And so everything that's going to go into the airway has to be sterile. And so sterile gloves, don't contaminate the device, just be careful, it has to be sterile, fresh saline. And it's really unusual for patients to decompensate after airway diagnostics, but they absolutely can. In my experience, the patients who decompensate tend to have more obstructive airway disease. So these are patients with things like collapsing trachea, where they're doing fine with the endotrach tube in, and then you extubate them, and then they do horribly because then they start to cough. Or a patient with a history of brachycephalic upper airway syndrome. Those patients always make me nervous if I'm doing an airway workup because inevitably they will um, struggle upon recovery. Um, patients with substantial concurrent cardiac disease may have a more difficult wake up too. But generally speaking, it's five minutes and then they're, they're back in their cage looking fine within 20 minutes. Any questions about that procedure? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so question about withdrawing antibiotics. So if I've got a treatment failure, what I'm on is not working, then to me it makes no sense to continue. Um, I usually want them off of antibiotics for at least two days. I mean, a week would be perfect, but depends on how critical the patient is. Because even if the antibiotic is not effective in the patient, it is still sometimes enough to hinder an effective culture result. So in a dream world, I say off of meds for seven days and then we'll do it. If a patient is fragile and I'm worried, then I would give them two days and then I would do it. Yes. You're actually probably going into a secondary bronchus, depending on the size of the patient. Um, so in a cat, probably we're probably just basically in, in a main stem bronchus because it's a, six, it's a six French, so a two millimeter device in a cat. You're probably about in the main stem. In a big dog though, you go, when we, in a big dog, I feel like you're miles in there. It's gonna come out of his back end. You're a long way in there. 
um, because you probably are down to secondary or tertiary and it just gently finds its way and then it gets stuck and then we do it. Any more questions? Yes. Great question about retrieval. So usually um, 20 in, I would say generally about 15 out if you're fast. I used to do lots of airway workups where we would just inject the saline and then start to aspirate back with a syringe through the same system so we can't turn on the suction. And by the time you've refigured yourself, it's gone. And so that saline is absorbed incredibly fast. So usually, if I'm doing this, within 20 seconds, what I've got back is what I'm going to get back. And then I think, ugh, the rest has been absorbed, and it does go amazingly fast. But usually, 20 and 50 now is a bit standard, but it just runs right across those alveoli and enters the circulation incredibly fast. Any more questions? Yes, at the back. Say again. Yes, good question. So um, I usually do it with them sternal just so that we can um, effectively kind of coupage and get a representative sample from both sides. I mean, potentially you could do it in lateral recumbency if there was some reason, but my routine position is going to be sternal. <laughs>